So I'm going to be talking about um, adding value where it matters to the client's business model. Um, key question for all of us is not necessarily whether we like our buildings, um, it's whether our clients like our buildings. And um, one of the challenges, um, uh, it, it, as you're about to see, is that not all clients are happy with what we're doing. Now the good news is that um, generally clients do appreciate and, and value the work we do. And the RVA's 2016 survey on, uh, and client survey reveals some really interesting um, data on, on, on who's satisfied with us out of the three groups of clients they refer to here, private, domestic, contractors and commercial. But as you can see, the contractor clients are not overly pleased with us, even on, on, on the overall um, front. The bad news is they're really not very pleased with us at all when it comes to our performance, um, and particularly the managing of the process, and, and I guess the issues that really matter to them. And that's a big deal. They also score us really low on commercial understanding and on adding value. And of course, what adding value means is very particular to each individual client. And so we're going to look at that a little bit more in, in this session. So contractors are increasingly key clients. Some of you may be lucky enough to not do a great deal of work for contractors. Um, you may feel you're sort of in this rather nice niche world of, of, of working on buildings like this, perhaps. Um, most of us, certainly my practice, do a lot of work for contractors. And we do a lot of work for contractors because we want to be retained on our buildings. And we want to make sure we, we see the project all the way through. And of course, that often means design and build. And that means we've got to win the uh, second tender off the contractor. This is really important, though, for us as a profession. Approximately half of all of our work comes from clients with a commercial mindset, whether that be um, contractors or whether it be commercial clients. Now, we all have this challenge, um, that differentiation between a really great CGI, what we really want to put on our website, and then what we find when we go back and visit the project after someone else has taken on the working drawings and someone else has delivered the project. And often that leads to real frustration between us and our, and our original client. Um, it leads to us feeling quite negative about the contracting industry. But to be quite frank, we can't whinge about it. We've got to do something about it, and we've got to make a difference, um, and we've got to get involved. And these two images, um, two CGIs of two buildings, on one of them, I think you can spot which one the CGI is. On the other one, perhaps you can't. The point is, same architect, different contractor, different developer, a different appreciation for seeing the project through to completion. But you could also argue, perhaps the image on the left didn't really appreciate the client's business model. Perhaps that was slightly too aspirational, perhaps that was never going to really be delivered. Um, and perhaps the architect has some responsibility in why it turned out the way it did. So this is relatively straight um, um, simplistic, but I think it's often important to kind of get a big picture of, 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 of how um, our industry works. And for us, we, we're focusing on three different types of client, patron, purpose, and profit clients. So what do I mean by that? Well, a patron client is a client who retains the building. They're commissioning that, that building for themselves. It might be for their own organization. It might be for themselves in the form of a private house. They may not need to borrow money, and they may not need to make a profit. They're doing it because they want that project for themselves. Purpose clients, they do retain the building. Um, but they are often running that building on, beh on, on behalf of an organisation for a greater purpose. Um, so that might be a client who is a local authority, etc. Um, and they may have to borrow money, they may get a grant, but they don't necessarily need to, need to make a profit. Profit clients, they need to sell that building and they need to make a profit on that venture. And they will almost certainly have to borrow money. So the banks become a really key player in the process. So some examples, patron clients, one-off houses, new company HQ, perhaps an art gallery, some of the projects we saw earlier. Purpose clients, charities, um, conservation work potentially, local authority projects, and finally, the profit clients work for contractors, housing developers, um, etc. And it helps to sort of try and think, where is my client? Where are their priorities? Where do they sit in this simple triangle of three different um, emphases within the project? <coughs> And a critical thing is to try and understand broadly what is it that their key priority is. So for a patron client, Venustas is key. They want a beautiful building, that's why they've come to an architect, and they're happy to pay for that architect, and they're happy to give you the time, normally, not always, but normally happy to give you the time to deliver a quality project. So in a sense, for patron clients, quality is relatively straightforward. If we don't achieve quality, we are to blame. 
There's very few excuses. Purpose clients gets a bit more complicated. Utilitas is key. Ultimately, they want to deliver on their overall objectives, the organisational objectives. They've got a mission, and they need that building to become a facilitator for furthering that mission. And finally, for profit clients, Firmitas is key. They want to maximise profit, they want to manage risk, um, and they're not necessarily risk-averse. They often like taking risks, but they want to manage that carefully. And they really care about things like programme. They care about the relatively boring things to us architects. So, we feel that building up empathy for our clients is really important. And Snipe is perhaps um, slightly unique in that I founded the practice having done almost no time working for anybody else. I, I finished my part three and set up Snug. Um, and that had its limitations, it had its challenges in that we had to grow slow, but it meant I didn't have any other way of looking at things. I only had a fresh perspective on it, I guess. And the, my business partner at the time was a builder. He came from a contracting background. Um, when we did a strength finder analysis, he scored zero on creativity, which is <laughs> really interesting in an architect's practice. And then Mike, who joined the practice later, is an engineer, qualified engineer and architect. So we sort of have empathy for different players in the process, and that DNA runs through our, our, our organisation. So how might we build empathy for our clients, and particularly for those commercial clients? Well, the first thing to understand is that the gross development value is what ultimately sets everything. Um, and the developers need to achieve a 20% margin. If they don't achieve that 20% margin, they won't get the money, the project won't get off the ground, and you won't get a job. So 20% margin, that's sacred. Nothing can touch that. They then have to go and buy some land. And unfortunately, in our industry, in the frenzy that is buying land, the person who bids the most, which means the person who bid too much, wins the land deal, which means we're all off to a really bad start. The construction cost, well, the construction cost goes through endless rounds of value engineering because it is the bit that must be squeezed between the two sandwiches of red and green. And the construction cost has obvious value to the developer. That is the product they're actually creating. And when all of that's said and done, whatever is left is fees. So we don't start from fees. The developer doesn't start from the position that you need a certain fee to do a job. He says, that's what's left. Cut the cloth. Make it work. Um, now, of course, they often come to us very early on for the fees, but they will have that spreadsheet, and if that figure you give them doesn't match that spreadsheet, um, you will get about, um, beaten down. Now, that sounds like a problem, but the critical thing is to learn how to leverage these problems and to turn them to our advantage. You see, the architect's fees are often more than half of the upfront risk cost of getting to a land deal. That has a huge amount of value. If you're a developer and you don't have land, you have nothing. So we've been looking at ways of, of, of leveraging that, and um, I, I, I may have had time to talk more about that. So we need to build empathy, and unfortunately, none of these slides are going to work. That's a real shame. Does anyone know why these slides have gone blank? Because these are my critical graphs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to explain it, which means I'm going to have to come and do some acting. OK, I want you to imagine on the left is risk, OK, and along the bottom is the RBA plan of work. The basic profile of a project is, from a developer's point of view, it starts with a huge amount of risk. You've got a one in five chance, maybe a one in ten chance of finding a piece of land. And you've got to spend money to find that piece of land. And you haven't got any money, because one thing you may not realise is very few developers actually have any money. They're just really good at getting money off other people. Um, so the last thing they want to do is spend the very small amount of money they have. Um, and if you imagine over the process, that risk drops. And one of the problems we have, and I'm going to see if it comes up now. Oh, yes, right. I'll make everything out of this graph. Um, so, one of the problems we have is that we tend to spend most of the fee relatively early in the process. And at that point, our clients have got a very large amount of risk. Um, they don't particularly want to hand over any money at that point. The other problem we have is they often don't get any real money until the land has planning permission. So, they may pretend they have money, they may have committed to spending money on your fees, but behind the scenes they don't actually have any cash in the bank a lot of the time. Um, so, for them, everything changes once planning permission is granted. And, of course, everything really changes when they've actually sold the stuff, once they've actually realised a profit. So, one of the things that we've been working on is how to help better align our fee structures to our clients' actual reality. And that can be leveraged to quite significant gain. So, some of our projects where we get involved in some of the risk share on the land deal, we can see 100% markup in our profit margins before the project's even started. Because people will hand over quite ludicrous sums of money for land deals. Um, but we can also look at sharing risk until such time as the project is over the, over the line. And of course, aligning value with our clients 
really make sure that they believe we're on the same page as them, and that builds positive long-term working relationships. And of course, finally, one can potentially shift some of one's fee to the end of the project and see markup on that fee at the same time. And of course, what that requires is good cash flow management. It requires us to be good managers of our businesses. And in our case, we spent three years setting aside 30% um, of, our, of our margins for three years to build up a buffer so that we could basically um, take on greater risks ourselves. So fees need to track the services rendered. Absolutely essential that we get paid for what we do. Um, and fees can also track the value we add. And I think that's something we all need to think a bit more about. But payment schedules potentially would benefit from tracking perceived risks. And there is real added value in being patient with your clients and um, trying to understand and have empathy for their particular situation. And of course, um, unfortunately the colour hasn't come out on this one either, but one of the critical things in this is, is, is procurement. And we do not provide one service for all clients. We don't provide the consistent service across every project type. We provide very different services depending on what kind of client we're dealing with and what they require. And so depending on where we are in design and build or where we are in traditional and who we're working for and the nature of the building, we need to tailor our services. Percentage fees don't fit with that. It has nothing to do with complexity necessarily. So a couple of case studies. The patron client. Well, the patron client, we're very familiar with the patron client. Um, here is a typical patron client. Um, the lady on the left, as you can see, doesn't look quite as happy as the man on the right. And that's because there's a process to go through to get to an agreement on a one-off house. And um, getting them to agree takes some iteration. And uh, that's all part of the process. That's part of the service we're providing. Coming alongside them, helping them in that negotiation, bringing ideas to the table and solving the, the issues that they bring to the table themselves. And that process of iteration, as we all know, can be very time consuming. And a good client doesn't mind paying for that. They know what they want and they want to get it right. And that's, that, that is value to them. What about purpose clients? Well, purpose clients, um, this project, Milford on Sea Beach Huts, has been quite a key project for us. Local authority, they wanted some replacement <coughs> beach huts, um, and there was a seawall behind the beach huts which needed repairing. And the beach huts were just really quite ugly block work um, boxes. And we managed to convince the council through a process of public engagement um, to significantly increase the brief. So basically, we didn't deliver on the brief. That's the first headline. Um, but we did deliver on their revised brief, and the critical thing was to take them on a process of, of, of enlarging and expanding the brief. So what we ended up creating was the 119 beach huts that they wanted, um, but we also got the sea wall completely replaced and integrated into those beach huts. We then managed to convince them that they really ought to put a promenade on the roof because the structural redundancy in the, in, in the sea wall wouldn't even notice people walking on its roof. Um, and then we were able to introduce public art and, and, and other elements into it. And the critical thing here was that the council came with a very particular objective. We need a seawall and we need some beach huts. Um, and we saw there were some real opportunities for public realm improvements at the same time. And what we were saying to the council is what we need here is the power of the end, not the tyranny of the oar. It's not a choice. You don't need to choose between building a seawall or building beach huts or building a promenade. We can have all three of these things. And as it happens, achieve a lot more at the same time. So I don't know where that slide's gone either. But anyway. Um, so what does that slide say? Seawall and promenade. Well, you've already imagined that. There was a promenade on the roof of the, of the seawall. And this is good. You're good at imagining stuff. You're architects, so we'll be all right. Um, we used graphic concrete to introduce um, kind of references to local landmarks, which people were able to walk to from the site. Um, we had some uh, 119 pieces of driftwood forming a kind of golden section spiral form on, on the end of the beach huts. And we, the task was to make concrete beautiful, but it created a lot of public interest and has really given some public art into the public realm. <coughs> we managed to reconcile the beach hut owners' concerns um, of the public coming anywhere near them and the public's concern of getting access to their seafront. And it's great to see a significant increase in occupation of this bit of the seafront in Milford-on-Sea. Um, so again, bringing together tensions. And, and, and critical to this was the inevitable kind of dynamism and tension that comes from the relationship between the two key players in the project. It was a collaboration between Ramble Consulting Engineers and, and Snug Architects. And the engineer rightly delivers the brief efficiently. The architect, possibly controversially, challenges the brief, questions whether it's the right brief, proposes an alternative brief, and manages to convince the councillors to put another million quid in the budget. 
Um, and the end result of that was more than they could have asked or imagined. Um, it's, it, the project's won 13 awards. Um, it, it's put Milford on Sea on the map. Um, lots of public increase in interest. And of course, that makes for a very happy client. Um, they've achieved more than they set out to achieve. So we managed to get all of these things uh, achieved within, within the, um, the project. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in by, I was quite excited by this, is that this started off as a liability, a couple of million pounds of expenditure to defend a sea, um, a sea wall. And most of the time, infrastructure projects are not seen as a way of making money. But what's fascinating is, when this project was completed, the beach huts were selling for £28,000 a pop, and that would have resulted in a 35% return on investment, which is significantly better than most property developers expect to get. But included in that was a free resurfacing of a car park, free public ramps, a free promenade, and free public art. None of that was paid for. Um, the frustration was the council, even though we had planning permission to build another 30 or 40 beach huts, decided they wouldn't do it because it involved going back into planning. Um, and they missed out on the opportunity to make a, a reasonably significant income for the local authority. So the tyranny of the ore needs to be replaced with the end. What about profit clients? So coming into land, just going to give a little case study of, of how we would approach actively engineering profit for our profit clients. And we, um, I have a bit of a rule in our office. I get very upset if anyone achieves less than 80% on a project, and I get very upset if anyone achieves more than 80% on a project. Um, as in, we mustn't spend too much time trying to get perfection, and we also got to up, uphold quality. Well, another thing we do in our office is try and have a spreadsheet running at the same time as we're designing. And we introduce something called heat mapping, because architects aren't very good at looking at numbers if they haven't got colours on them. So by adding colours to the numbers, we found people engaged a lot more. And so what we did was we picked up a scheme um, from one of our clients, which already had an existing planning application, had an existing layout, conversion of an office building into residential. And um, this was one particular floor plate. And on that particular floor plate, and unfortunately the yellow thing has moved, um, the GDV for that floor plate was 2.2 million. And we, we ran the heat map, and everything was coming out very cold. So we rejigged the layouts, re-ran the heat map, and we generated um, about another 600,000, 700,000 pounds worth of GDV off that single floor plate. But we had another look at it, and we could see that we were able to achieve units that were getting up to 575 pounds a square foot. And not unsurprisingly, the client at that point says, well, why aren't they all 575 pounds a square foot? Um, that's when you have to start working closely with your client on the debate about quality, because of course there start becoming consequences to pushing too close to the edge and flying too close to the sun. But we managed to um, rework it another time, and this time we got up to three point, just under 3.2 million. So we'd added just under a million pounds to the GDV of a single floor plate. Not a single square foot of additional building was required to do that. It was just about getting into and truly trying to understand the relationship between pound per square foot rates, that location, the market, working with the estate agents, and getting involved in the client's development appraisal. And so we expect to have a copy of the development appraisal on our desk as we're developing the scheme. So that process, no additional floor area, getting into what the market needed in that location, what ceiling prices were for different units, etc., and really getting into a detailed conversation about value. Um, and that's obviously just a quite a focused example. But we're finding in, in, in all these projects, getting into the client's um, cost plan properly is, is making a big difference, and clearly that helps retain clients. So the power of the and is really important. You know, we do need our priorities. Our priorities as architects are important priorities. We've, you know, we've studied for seven years to establish a deep understanding of what makes quality in the built environment. And we really need to see those things delivered on. But we also need to recognize we're here to serve our clients and their priorities are equally valid and really important. And to be quite frank, if we don't value those as, as highly as we value our own priorities, why on earth will they choose to work with us? Um, design quality matters, but so does technical design performance and good process management. And I think as a profession, if we're going to really deliver quality, and we're going to deliver quality in the eyes of our clients, we're going to need to work out how to do that um, process stuff a bit more carefully. So three key takeaways. Know your client. It's really important to try and understand where they sit on that triangle of patron, purpose, and profit. Work out how to align value with them. 
Above all, that means often being true to your values and attracting clients who share those values with you. Um, but ultimately, at times, we have to work out how to align with their values. And if you don't like it, probably best we don't work with those clients. And finally, we need to achieve the end. It's really important that we use our creativity to achieve their objectives and achieve our own objectives at the same time. Thank you.